Uh, listen, my name is Minister Dorian Williams, and I'm so honored and glad to be able to stand before you today and uh, explain to you what thus saith the Lord unto me. Uh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and honor our pastor and our first family. Let's go ahead and give them praise, Pastor David and Lady Karen, in their absence on today. Amen. We thank God for the spirit of rest and understanding that at times you need to rest. And it's okay for our pastor and his wife and their family to go away and to rest because we know when they go away and rest, God is literally downloading and rewarding them and, and we can't wait till he comes back. Amen. 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 Let's give a hand for Pastor Outing and the amazing word he delivered on last week. Pastor Outing, God bless you, sir. I don't tell you enough, but I honor you so much in your wisdom and uh, everything that God does through you and everything that comes out of you. I, I, I honor you. You literally embody what ministry should be, the way you so freely give and the way you dissect God's word, man. I, I honor you if nobody else does. Thank God for you. And thank you for setting the table on last week and the word that was delivered in the house. Amen. Amen. Listen, I also want to give honor to my wife and my family, my Karen, not his Karen. He has his, I have mine. Let's don't get it twisted. It's not that kind of church. <laughs> I'd like to give honor to my wife, Karen, and my children, my daughter, my family who's here supporting. Thank you. Thank God for them, and I love them, and I thank God for them and how they keep and put up with me. Amen. I can be a handful. So God gave me a good one when he gave me my wife. 18 years in, it feels just like yesterday. I love you, honey. Yeah, that's a good place to clap, amen. Amen, amen. Listen, I won't be before you very long, but I do believe there's a word from the Lord, so don't worry, I'm not a long-winded preacher. If you're hungry, this is the Sunday to be in church because I won't preach long, and I promise you, I'll be, I'll be through just as soon as I get finished, amen. Amen. Listen, if you have your Bible, if you have your iPad, if God has not blessed you yet and you have an Android phone, we pray for you. We're seeking God on your behalf. Turn with me to James chapter 2. I'm going to continue along in this series, Jay walking through James. Turn with me. You can stay with me. To James chapter 2. And I am going to begin at verse 14. And I'm just going to read 14 through 17, but my topic today is going to encompass 14 through 26 for the end of that chapter, if you just want to make note of that. But James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. If you got it, say amen. Amen. That sounds like all the church. And the word of God declares, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Key verse, verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and it is useless. I just want to speak to you briefly for a couple minutes from this little uh, sermon topic of the walking dead. The walking dead. God, once again, I just want to thank you um, for life, health, and strength on today. Thank you for another opportunity to share what you have spoken to me. God, I pray that you breathe on 
this sermon on this morning. God, speak through me. Move me out of the way. I thank you, God, that the soil is already ready and fertile. Let the seeds of what I'm about to say fall and take root, go forth and grow, so that we may carry out what you would have for us to do in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The walking dead. The Walking Dead is a popular series on television that, that portrays individuals trying to get away from zombies. These zombies are individuals who appear to be alive but are literally walking yet dead. They have the basic appearance of a living person, activity of limbs, communication, vision and hearing capabilities, sense of smell and taste but they are still categorized as dead. And unfortunately, spiritually, some of us are just like these zombies. We have the appearance of one who is alive, activity of limbs, communication, vision and hearing capabilities, sense of smell and taste, but spiritually, they are, there are no signs of life whatsoever. We walk around and we can shout the dust out of a carpet, but literally possess no power. We can come in church, we can do church, we can speak in tongues. He's coming on the Honda and the Kawasaki, literally saying nothing, possessing no power, walking dead. You see, for some of us, the faith that we claim is only a verbal proclamation that shows no signs of life and we are literally walking around spiritually dead. I believe my assignment today is to help you understand that our faith should be one that produces so that others seek God and be drawn to him. Let me say that again. I believe that my assignment today is to help you understand that our faith should be one that produces so that others will see God, not Dorian, so that others will see God, not Pastor David, so that others will see God and be drawn to who? To him. You see, I like to, when I teach, I like to teach with examples because it helps me drive the point home. And literally when I thought about things that could be walking dead, that should have uh, some life, that should have some activity, I said, well, God, how can I make this point come home and how can I manage to make sure that they have a clear understanding of what you told me to say? So I have some examples. Have you ever been walking around or driving and literally seen a tree that appeared to be alive but was actually dead? The core looked very strong. It looked like it was secured to the ground. But when you look up at the leaves, everything was drooping. Everything was brown. It literally had no life in it and it stuck out like a sore thumb from around the other ones because it was literally perpetrating. That's what we used to say back in the day. It was perpetrating and perceiving to be something that it really wasn't. It was literally dead. Have you ever gotten into your car, got somewhere to go, put the key in, turn the ignition, and nothing happens? How frustrating is that? How upset were you that you had planned that you had gotten yourself to look good, you got on cologne and perfume, you got the bag, you're ready to roll, you was probably on your way to church. Put your key in the ignition of your car, turned it, and nothing happens. It was literally dead. Have you ever seen someone who claimed to have faith, but their life looks nothing like it? Yeah, I think I'm in the house now. Have you ever seen some folks, and I'm not talking about anybody in here, I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. Have you ever seen some folks who literally just, just called themselves the hand and feet of God, but spiritually there was no fruit, there was nothing that would point you back to Christ after you had an interaction with them? I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the walking dead. Just the walking dead. You see, this is what we have to understand. There is a baseline level of expectation that accompanies who we claim to be or what something is supposed to be. Just a baseline level of expectation 
of what it is. If I see a tree, I expect for the tree to bear fruit, to provide oxygen, to provide shade. Baseline level of expectation that accompanies who we should be or what something should be. If I see a car, car should provide transportation. If I get into the car and I'm not going anywhere, what point is it to use it? The car should be one that gets me from point A to point B. Minister Bruce, just a baseline level of expectation, right? A car should get me from A to B. Trees should bear fruit. A house should provide shelter. I wouldn't want to live in a house that has no roof, no windows, no walls, just a frame. That's not a house. That's just a, what something could be. That's the baseline level of expectation. Now, if you want to be bougie and you want to have crown molding, that's up to you. If your money affords that, that's cool. I'm just being facetious. Y'all don't mind me. But there's a baseline level of expectation that comes along with who you should be and where you want to be. Baseline level of expectation. If you're going to be a wife, you should be able to cook and clean. If you're going to be a husband, you should be able to eat and watch sports all day. All the brothers clapping right there. All the brothers like, yeah. Y'all going to get in trouble when y'all get home for clapping with me. Because that's not how it goes in my house. Right? I cook. My wife watches Lifetime all day. <laughs> y'all, come on. We in church. Come back. Come back. Come back. Listen, there's just a baseline level of expectation of how things should be if you claim to be, if something claims to be, there's a baseline level of expectation that accompanies with who you say you are or what something should be. Are we all in agreement? Somebody say amen. 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 Praise God. So listen, let me get into the text. So James here, as Pastor Outing said last week, he's literally the brother of Jesus. He had firsthand account of everything that Jesus said and did. So there's this transition period where the Jewish faith and Messianic Jews are trying to get used to or trying to adopt and understand fully the teachings of Christ because all Christ was doing was fulfilling the law and, 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 and laying claim and laying a foundation for the law and what should be done. Because you have some Messianic Jews here who got so, got so accustomed to performing and, and, and taking part in these religious acts to make sure that they were doing religiously A, B, C, and D, that they forgot that there's some other things that go along with that. In other words, it does no good for you to be so spiritually wound up but no earthly good to where you can't witness to anybody and nobody can get anything from your life. And these Jews were in a place where they had begun, they, they had gotten so... Uh, a custom they knew God's word but they lost its substance they could quote the Old Testament and the Torah from front to back and that's what they did back then but but somewhere along the line of everything that they gone through they had literally lost the substance of the word they were more concerned with the act and not the reason that the word was given to us amen and some of us in here today we have gone through so many things and for whatever our reason, but we're now turning into religious people who we just come to church and clap our hands. We come to church and we say amen. We come to church and we know the service from A to B. We can shout, we can sing all the songs, and now we're just like those Messianic Jews who we understand and we're more concerned with the act and not the reason. And that's a bad place to be. Because now you end up worshiping what you do and not worshiping who he is. And that's why we do it. Because we ought to be more concerned with who he is and not what we have to do. Am I making sense in the house? We're more concerned with looking like we're saved instead of being saved. I don't know about you, but I don't want to look saved. I want to be saved. I want to embody Christ's words. I want to embody God's teachings. It does no good for anybody else, not even myself, to just look like I'm holy. You can come in here with the longest white dress all the way down to the, to the ground, and your suit can be creased as all get out, but that does nothing, and God cares nothing about that. He'd rather you come in here with a T-shirt, socks, and basketball shorts and be saved in your heart 
than to look like you're saved by what you got on. There's a baseline level of expectation of who we should be, how we should be it. So let me get to my first thought. I told y'all I won't be long. I got 20 minutes. I probably won't need that much time because I believe God is already breathing in this place and already making things plain. But here's my first thought. Faith is not only what you say, but it's also what you do. It's a combination. Faith is not only what you say, but it's also what you do. Verse 17 says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and it is useless. Dead faith is stagnant, but living faith is active. Dead faith is stagnant. Living faith is active. You don't believe me? Let's look at Abraham. The scripture quotes Abraham in verse 24, I believe, and it talks about how Abraham was used by God. God spoke to Abraham, told him, I need you to go to another place that you don't know about, that you don't possess, but you're going to possess it. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you as many seeds as you can see in the stars, and it's all going to come from you, right? Abraham believed it, but the Bible says that Abraham was considered righteous after his face produced and heartfelt action. It wasn't until he followed through with what he believed in his heart about what God said that he was considered righteous. It was not enough for Abraham just to believe it, but God needed him to do something to show that he believed it. He needed to embody what he already believed. He needed to embody what he claimed to believe. Abraham wasn't considered righteous until after his faith produced a heartfelt action. It was not only what he said, but it was also what he did. Faith is not only what you say, but it's also what you do. Dead faith is stagnant. Living faith is active. Let me give you this question to think on. You don't have to answer out loud. Will you trust God when he tells you to move and you don't know where he's asking you to go? Think about it. That's a tough one. Will you trust God when he's telling you to move, but you don't know what's on the other side of it? And this is how God operates, and this is how he functions. I already believe God is going to do some things for my life. God has showed me some things already. I have a glimpse of what God is going to do. But God's not going to do it if I don't act on it. And this is where most of us is. God is saying, hey, you know what? Over there is going to be something great. This is the vision that I have for you. And we'd be like, yeah, cool, God, all right. Y'all see that boy? Hey, God got that over there for me. You see that? That's going to be mine. Five years later, hey, God said that's going to be mine. Boy, you see that? You see that thing over there? God said that's going to be mine. Ten years later, man, y'all see that thing over there? God said, that's going to be mine. But here it is. You could have had it 10 years ago. God said it was going to be yours, but there's something that you have to do to go get it. We expect God to say, hey, this is going to be yours, and I'm going to bring it to you. Sometimes, I'm not saying that God can't work that way. Sometimes he can. But most times, it takes something out of us to get what he already says is for us. And some of you all are frustrated with God because he showed you a glimpse and you don't have it yet, but you haven't done anything to get it. Don't be mad with God because you have stagnant faith. Your faith should be active. If you have enough faith to believe it, if you have enough faith that what he said, that you can take it to the bank, you should begin to move on it and go towards what God said is already yours. Let me bring it home and make it personal. I was working in a job six months, position came up, I could have had it, but I didn't meet all the qualifications. I said, never again will I allow myself to be put in a place where I can't get what I'm supposed to have because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. God had already told me, but I missed a mark some time ago that placed me in a position where I couldn't get it. So I went forth and did what I needed to do. God gave me double and put me in a greater position because I did what I was supposed to do compared to what he said I was going to be and where I was already going to go. When God gives you a vision, he gives you the vision. 
but he's also going to give you an assignment to go along with that vision. We have to go along with the assignment and do our part to get what God said he has for us. Faith is not only what you do. Faith is not only what you say, but it's also what you do. Second thought. Faith should compel you to act when everything else around you says no. Faith should compel you to act when everything else around you says no. Verse 25 gives a snippet of Rahab. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them away safely by a different road. James is pointing out to Rahab and giving them a glimpse, and just, just pause for a second here. When James is communicating with these Jews, he's using stories that they already know to bring home his point, because they already know what happened with Rahab in that situation back in Joshua. And if you don't know, if you missed Sunday school this morning, let me just go ahead and remind you what happened with Rahab. Joshua was given the assignment to go ahead and take the land, sent spies out, the spies went over, crossed the Jordan, got to that place, Rahab gave them shelter this is what Rahab does. Rahab talks to those spies that were sent out by Joshua when God gave the command to go ahead and spy the land to see what it looks like. She gives them shelter. Rahab tells the two spies, listen, we know who you are. We know the God that is on your side and what he's already done for you. We are scared and trembling in the city, but this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hide you give you shelter so you can see what you need and I'm going to send you off a different way. The guards hear that the spies are in the city. They come to Rahab. She sends them off a different way, sends the spies off another way. It was Rahab's faith in what God had already done and that what she knew the God of Israel could do that forced her to say, hey, I'm going to err on the side of God and not on the side of what's already going on in the town. Faith should compel you to act when everything else around you says no. Rahab did not believe in the God of Israel, but she heard of what was, what was going on and how God was moving on their behalf. And because of that, she wanted to be a part of that. God honored her and her faith in that moment because when Joshua and the Israelite army came back to overtake the town, her and her family were spared. Faith should compel you to act when everything else around you says no. Do you believe God when what's around you contradicts what he, what he says? That's the thought. That's the question. Do you believe God when everything around you contradicts what he says? Rahab had faith and knew the God of Israel, but everything around her and her city and her king said otherwise. She literally risked death to herself and her family based on the faith she had in God. Faith should compel you to act when everything else around you says no. Rahab chose what God could possibly do instead of what she knew her city could do. Y'all missed that. Rahab chose what God could possibly do. Some of us need to be on the side and choose what God could possibly do as opposed to what we can do on our own. I tend to choose, and I'm trying to lean and grow to a place where what God can possibly do. I'm 41 years old. I believe at this point in my life, I've tried everything. I was that manly person. I can do it on my own. I can try it all on my own. But I've been through enough situations and God has showed himself over to me over and over and over again enough times to now I'm more confident in what God maybe can do as opposed to what I think I can do. Faith should compel you to act when everything else around you says no. You see, dead faith, dead faith sees God moving and stands still. Living faith takes a chance. Dead faith sees God moving, stands still. Living faith sees it and takes a chance. I'd rather step out into the water of what God could possibly do than stand on the shore and watch everybody else go by, get blessed, get anointed, get used, get favored, and I'm standing there wondering what could happen, but I'm so comfortable in the soil. Dead faith sees God's moving, stands still. Living faith takes a chance.
face should compel you to act when everything else around you says no. I don't care what it looks like. If God says go, go. I don't care what you think. If God says this way, go this way. I don't care what it looks like around you. Hell could be breaking loose. The walls could literally be falling down. If God says stay, he has enough wisdom and knowledge and power to protect you when everything else around you is crumbling and falling down. Faith should compel you to act when everything else says no. So the question is, Minister Dorian, that sounds really good. It looks good in theory. How do I put that into practice? I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you for asking that question. I heard the whole church asking that question. Looks good. Sounds good. How do I keep my faith alive? How do I get to the point to where I believe God more than what I see? How do I get to the point to where my faith is elevated enough to no matter what's around me, I choose God's report as opposed to my own understanding? How do I get to that point? Here's my third and final thought. Allow God to refine and purify you. Did y'all hear? Did y'all catch that? Did you catch it? Allow God to refine and purify you. First Peter 1 and 7 says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Allow God to refine and purify you. Here it is. If you really understood the refining and the purifying process, y'all be running around this church right now, but let me make it make sense. So in the old days, a goldsmith, when he wanted to purify gold, place a gold in a pot, heat it up, thousands of degrees, heat it up, heat it up, let it boil, heat it up. And once it was heated up to a certain temperature and a certain point, the impurities would literally rise to the surface. He'd take a special tool, skim the impurities off. It would heat up. It would continue to heat, continue to heat. The impurities would continue to rise up, skim the impurities off the surface, off the surface. Continue to heat, continue to heat. The gold is continuing to heat. And the more the goldsmith let the heat build, the impurities would rise up and he would skim the impurities off the surface until the point where the gold was so hot, he had skimmed so many impurities off the top. He knew the gold was ready, that it was refined and pure when he would look down in the pot and he would see his own face. I, this side got it. Let me go back over here. Y'all, y'all, Bravis, y'all start praising. This side gonna catch it in a second. Boiling, 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 impurities off, boiling. Boiling, impurities off. Boiling, boiling, impurities scraped off. Now, I don't see any more impurities rising up and I know the gold is refined and pure because I can see my face in it. God wants to get you to a point. He allows you to go through certain things that heat up your life so he can literally get all the impurities removed. He's refining and purifying you. He's getting you to the point where you're even more precious than gold. So don't be upset. Don't be afraid when you face trials and tribulations in your life. Because you just asked me the question how to get to the point where you had that Abraham and that Rahab type of faith. You have to allow God to purify and refine you. You got to let God go take, take you through some things so you understand who he is. You got to let God take you through some trials and some tough places in your life.
Sometimes you may have to lose a loved one. You may have to lose a job. You may have to lose some finances. Some friends may have to come away. Some old thoughts and some ways that you had may have to come away. But that's literally the, the impurities rising to the top and God just skimming them off the top of your life. And he's going to continue that process. As they rise up, he gets them out the way. They said they were your friends, but he's getting them out the way. You thought that was your career, but he's moving that out the way. You thought this was the, the, the limit of your strength and what you can do, but he's moving those thoughts out of the way. And once he gets all those impurities out of the way, he looks at you and he says, oh, there I am. I see Dorian, but there I am. I see Bravis, but I see me. I see Minister Bruce, but I see myself. So now I know when they go out, people won't see Bruce. People won't see Dorian. People won't see Bravis. They won't see Pastor David. They'll just see God. How do you get to that point? Allow God to refine and purify you. I know it's uncomfortable, but it's working on our behalf. I know it's difficult, but you'll be better on the other side. Allow God to refine and purify you. He knows how you should look. He knows when the process is complete. He knows when you're stronger and wiser and where you need to be. Allow him to continue to skim off the top. It gets hot. Stay with the process. It gets warm. Stay with the process. It gets uncomfortable. Stay with the process. It gets overbearing. Stay with the process. It feels like things are being pulled away from you. Stay with the process. It feels like he's literally taking things away from your life. Stay with the process. He's purifying you. He's refining you. When you get through with this, you'll shine like never before. You thought you were worth something now. Your worth is going to increase when he's through with you. You're going to be greater than you ever thought you would be. Places that you never thought you would go. Doors that you never thought you would walk in. God wants to put you in that place. Allow him to purify and refine you. Stick with the process. It takes more than just the belief. It's more than just understanding. It takes more than that. Allow God to do the more in your life so he can give you more. That's the ticket. If you want more, allow God to do more with you. And we're not just doing this just for vain glory. We're doing this so when God puts us in a position, we get more. They see him in us and not ourselves. The goal is for God to get you to the point where you look more like him. I don't want to look like me anymore. I've messed up enough. I want to look like God. When you see me, I want you to see the Lord. Don't look at me. Look at what I've been through. Look at what I've overcome because of him and see him. They say that God is not a respecter of person. That's what the word says. God is not a respecter of person. So what he does for me, he can do for you. I just stand here today as a vessel that God has used to portray a message. If you want to be more like God, if you want to be closer to him, allow him to finish the process in you. He that has begun a good work shall perform it. He that has begun a good work, he's mandated, he said it, shall perform it. Everybody under the sound of my voice, whether you're in the building, watching on YouTube or Facebook, catching this video, this video two or three years from now, he that has begun a good work shall perform it. Do you know God that has begun a good work in you and you're going to allow him to perform it, to perform it? Can you give God praise in the building? Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you for what was said and done on today from the worship to the word to this atmosphere. 
where you have literally charged your people to believe at a greater level. Thank you, God, that the seeds of the worship and the word and everything that was said and done in this house today is falling on fertile ground. God, we will not be the same when we exit this building. I thank you, God, for the testimonies that are going to come forth for honoring you and your word. I thank you, God, for doors of opportunity that are going to open that I literally see in the spirit realm in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for moving on behalf of your people as we move closer to you and to give ourselves up to you. Thank you, God, for everything that you're going to do. And God, we bless you and we magnify your name. If you receive that word today, give God praise and shout amen.